Hi, I'm Ed Hammerly from NJ Renewable Energy. We're back here at my home today. We're going to be installing a solar thermal SunMax evacuated tube system. This will be producing approximately 90% of my hot water needs here at my home. All right, let's have a quick history lesson here before we start. So you understand, there are essentially two forms of solar renewable energy here for residential purposes. Uh, and that is PV, photovoltaic, which you see on my roof, which is making electricity. And then, of course, the evacuated tubes, which makes heat, solar thermal, which in this case we're going to use for domestic hot water, although you could use it for heating as well. One of the reasons I chose SunMax was for its versatility. They sell many different products for many different applications. Um, this particular application, I'm going to be using evacuated tubes. Now, there is another form of solar thermal called flat plates. Um, some people say that flat plates are better, some say evacuated tube. The truth of the matter is, neither one is necessarily better. It all depends on where you are and how you're using it and what your demands are. The reason why I chose the evacuated tubes over the flat plate is that, for one, I'm in New Jersey. Um, so we have winter, of course. And during the winter months, the evacuated tubes tend to outperform the flat plate. Uh, the other reason is that they also outperform flat plates during cloudy conditions and so forth. So I'm trying to maximize my BTU intake during the winter months. So that was one. Uh, I also like it just for cosmetic reasons. I think they look a little better. Flat plate collectors can be a little larger, a little heavier, and sometimes need more than one person to install. But again, it's not that they're inferior to evacuated tubes. The fact of the matter is there are many applications when the flat plate is far better. What is an evacuated tube and how does it work? When they say the term evacuated, basically what that means is that they've taken all the air out of the, out of the glass tube. Just like a thermos bottle, we know that when you put coffee in there, it stays hot for hours upon hours. Same thing. Uh, temperature has a very difficult time transferring through empty space. So essentially, that's what goes on on the outside here. This glass tube has, has no air inside of it. And then in the middle, there's a copper tube. And inside that copper tube, that is also has evacuated. There's no air inside. But inside there is a few droplets of, of a fluid. So what happens is, over time, when the sun goes through it, it goes through the glass and it can't escape back out, it's trapped inside there, it essentially heats up that copper tube in the middle. And as time goes on, uh, because that fluid is also in a, it, like I said, in an evacuated area, there's no air, um, it, it boils at a lower temperature. So when it boils, it basically turns to steam, and as we know, heat rises, it goes up into the manifold, the top of the collector, and transfer its, transfers its heat into the, into the uh, manifold, condenses, rolls back down, and essentially that process continues again and again and again. As you can see, I've gone with the ground-based collector. I personally think this is the best way to go. Uh, one of the reasons is that my connections into the house are very, very close. So I don't have long leads from the roof all the way down to the basement. In this case, uh, my uh, tank is only five or six feet away from this uh, wall. So we've eliminated a lot of material. Uh, the heat losses through the pipe are less. The collector is on the ground where you can service it if need be or clean debris off of it and so on and so forth. Um, and it also leaves space on the roof if you have uh, photovoltaics. You're, if you're going to put them up there, you're not going to take space away uh, where those might go. Some of you may have noticed that there's an overhang over the collector. Now, during the late summer months, when the sun is as high as it is in, in the sky, this will put shade on the collector. As a matter of fact, it's starting to put shade on it now. Um, however, this is not a problem for me. And that is because the amount of BTUs that can be captured during the summer months far exceeds the capabilities during the, during the winter. So we actually have excess BTUs that we don't even know what to do with. We don't have a pool or a hot tub where we can stick that, that heat into the water. So therefore we have a dump on the top of the collector that it basically just takes this captured heat and then puts it back into the atmosphere. So we've eliminated some of that by the, by the fact that it's being shaded during the, the peak of the summer. Um, the other benefit, I think, is that during the uh, winter time, uh, when it, there's snow, it'll keep snow off the collector, it just keeps the environment off of it, it just, I think, takes care of it a little better. So, uh, in my opinion, and, and under my certain circumstances, it, it works out perfectly. We're just about to begin the installation, but let's go over two critical points that you need to know before you design a system and purchase a particular product. Number one is SRCC certification and in particular, OG100 and OG300. This independent third-party organization 
rates and certifies solar thermal products for design, durability, reliability, safety, operation, service, installation, and maintenance, just to name a few. So it is in every consumer's best interest to make sure that your product has both of these certifications. Not to mention, some states will not provide incentives or rebates without it. The other critical point is conservation. Reduce your demand before you create and design a system. Make sure all your appliances and electronics use energy and water wisely. In addition, change your shower heads to low flow. Here we went from 3 gallons per minute to 1.5. We replaced all the aerators for all the faucets to 1 gallon per minute. And in one day, we reduced our hot water needs by 50%. This is why when most solar thermal companies are suggesting that you could reduce your demand by 50 to 80 percent, I'm thinking I can do better since we've drastically reduced the amount of hot water we need to begin with. Alright, so here's how my SunMax system went together. We first attached the small brackets to the manifold. We then do the same thing to the base tube frame. Now we're ready to attach the arms to the manifold. Once all three arms are on, we flip it over and begin installing the triangle plate. Up on the roof, this one. Once all three triangle plates are attached, we now connect the legs. We also add the feet to the legs. Once the feet are attached, we will now take a horizontal bracket and connect each arm to each leg. Finally, before moving it towards the house, we attach the base tube frame to the arms. Now that it's against the house, we check it for plumb and square and begin to secure it against the house. We've attached the racking system with weather resistant and high shear strength deck screws. Alright, it's time to move into the basement. And just like the outside, there are many ways to get this accomplished. And sometimes there are ways that are cheaper with existing equipment. However, I think what I'm going to show you today is the most efficient way to do this. Here we are installing an 80 gallon solar storage tank without any secondary heating source. However, this tank will supply a tankless heater that will, if necessary, add additional heat without the issues of standby losses. Step 1 is installing the OG300 Butler Wand Heat Exchanger. It exchanges heat passively so there's no secondary pump that you need to run electricity in order to exchange heat from the collector into the tank. Another great feature is that you can use it with an existing tank as long as it has 3 quarter inch fittings at the top. But its best feature is how well it stratifies water in a tank. Because there is no mixing or pumping water through the tank, the hottest water stays where you want it, at the top. This is critical. I would much rather have 120 degree water at the top of the tank than 95 degree water throughout. This way the first 20, 30 or 40 gallons of water will be 120 degrees, so therefore my tankless system will never turn on, otherwise it would have to supplement the rest. So here we are threading in the connection to the top of the tank. Once the wand is in, we mount our pump station. Mount the tankless system, in this case it's electric. Drill our holes to the outside. We attach the appropriate safety devices such as relief valves and mixing valves. We also install several check valves. These are absolutely required in order to prevent thermal convection. In other words, this prevents the hot water in your tank from escaping at night back into the collector.